Don't use historical inflation in your retirement plan. Part dos, as we say in Mexico. Mexico, part dos. I mean, it's two for you gringos who don't speak Spanish like I do. All right. Part dos. All right. So, again, this is part of my book, Relax and Retire. If you want a signed copy, send me 20 bucks. I'm a money-grubbing capitalist. I'll be happy to send you a signed copy. If you want to just buy it on Kindle, I think it's Kindle Unlimited. It's free. Um, I don't know what the other Kindle price is. I just can't remember. Uh, we got an Audible, and we got it on uh, on paperback too. I think the paperback's nine nine nine. The Kindle, I just on the non Kindle Unlimited, I don't know what it costs. Uh, and of course, if you like these videos, I do a cup of coffee. It's supported. Buy me a cup of coffee. Decap is all I need, baby. So, all right. So we're going to talk about OER now. All right, because what happened was, as I talked about the last video, is we had a massive change in the how they attributed to housing in 1977. All right, massive change. And before that, as we talked about before in 1930s, we can see. Food, actually right here, 1930s, food was the biggest representation of CPI in the 1930s. Oh, the 1950s, food was almost a third of CPI, 30% uh, of CPI, whereas housing slowly crept up to about 33%. Um, but apparel was still about 9% back then. Isn't that crazy? In the 1930s, apparel was 10%. So apparel has been 10% of CPI roughly for as long as we can see until now. Now it's 2.4. Crazy. All right, so then we had a massive change in 1977. All right, check this out. The BLS data from 2022 is below. You'll notice that shelter represents 32.47% of total CPI, all right, which is only a bit higher than it was in 1977. If we go to 1977, we can see shelter right there, 31% in 1977. So in 1977, housing was 45% of total CPI, of which shelter was 31%, all right? 2022, we come down here, we see shelter is still 32% of total CPI. Well, that doesn't change much. Ah, but notice the difference. How is shelter determined now? 24% to owner's equivalent rent and 7.3% to rent of primary residence. How was it determined before? Shelter, rent was 5%. Look at this, home ownership, 25% was home ownership which was attributed to home purchase and finance and taxes and insurance. So basically your mortgage, essentially. You're buying a house and a mortgage. Rent was only 5%. Isn't that crazy? So check this out. Now rent is 7.3 and owner's equivalent rent is 24. That is what falls under shelter. You know what is no longer under shelter? Home purchase, home ownership, financing taxes and insurance. Rent of primary residence is pretty simple to understand, but what the heck is OER? Well, the BLS tells us. The expenditure weight in the CPI market basket for OER, owner's equivalent rent, is based on the following question that the CEX, Consumer Expenditure Survey, asks of consumers, they do this every year, to calculate CPI, who own their own home. So, this, so the BLS is saying, hey, consumers, we have this Consumer Expenditure Survey we take the data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey, and that gives us our weightings to determine what CPI is, the inflation rate. Again, inflation, the CPI is what we use for Social Security costs, living adjustments, everything is CPI. Tax rates. So they ask homeowners, if someone were to rent your home today, how much do you think it would rent for monthly, unfurnished, and without utilities? Hmm. You can read the definition and justification of OER here if you're so inclined. But remember, the point of CPI is to do what? Is to the objective of the CPI is to measure the change in expenditures required to maintain a certain st a given standard of living. So <laughs> CPI, the point is to measure the change in expenditures required to maintain a given standard of living. So then why would we say if someone were to rent my home today, how much do I think would rent monthly unfurnished and without utilities? The BLS then throws this in the mix. The BLS, this is 1977, they explored two major approaches to determine how to estimate cost of shelter services for owner-occupied dwellings. The first approach attempts to estimate the flow of shelter services for an owned dwelling from items related to living in it. You think? This approach is called user cost. So we're going to use how much it costs to live in your home as a measure of CPI. That makes sense. That's the first approach. This approach called user cost includes items such as real estate taxes, insurance, Interest estimate based on the market value of the house. Okay, that's a user cost. How much it costs to live in your home? 
The second approach to measure housing costs and CPI is to estimate the flow of services for an owner dwelling based on market rents for rented dwellings. <laughs> so the second approach is to basically say, hey, how much would your, your house go for if you were to rent it? This research led to a method referred to as rental equivalents. This method measures, this is literally from the BLS, by the way. I'm not pulling this out of my butt. This is from them. This method measures the rate of change in the amount an owner would need to pay in order to rent on the open market. It's based on actual market rents collected from a sample of renter-occupied housing units that are identified to be representative of owner-occupied housing. All right, so we went from using the first approach, user costs, to include items such as real estate taxes, insurance, and interest estimate based on the market value of the home. So we're using Again, user costs, we look back at what it was in 1977, home ownership, home purchase, financing taxes, and insurance. That's the user cost. Now we go to rent and owner's equivalent rent, and the owner's equivalent rent is what? It measures the rate of change an owner would need to pay in order to rent on the open market, which is based on what? It's based on actual market rents collected from a sample of renter-occupied housing units that are identified to be representative of owner's occupied housing. I want to paint the picture from the BLS's perspective. They used to acknowledge that your house had regular costs, like user costs, property taxes, homeowners insurance, maintenance. These costs are a regular expense and should be included in CPI because the whole point about CPI is to do what? To measure the change in expenditures required to maintain a standard of living. But that's not what the BLS did when they changed their measurement for housing costs. In 1981, they, use, they change the calculation from a user cost approach, like we just talked about, all right, to this monstrosity. So user a cost approach estimate the flow shelter for, uh, for services of living in a house, property taxes, maintenance, all that, to this. This new method, method measures the rate of change in the amount an owner would need to pay in order to rent on the open market. All right, that makes sense. The largest component of CPI is based on how much a homeowner would need to pay in order to rent his house to himself on the open market. The table below provides a visualization of this from 1982. All right, so here we are now. Here we were before. So here we were before. Home ownership was 25% of the entirety of CPI. Housing was 46% of the total CPI, of which shelter was 31%. Of, 30, of that 31% of shelter, 25% of entirety CPI was for home ownership. 10% to home purchase and 12% to financing. And then another right here, look at this. On top, of that would be contracted mortgage interest cost. And you can see right here, the new CPI, none of that's in here. Financing taxes, insurance, home purchases, property insurance, property taxes, contracted uh, insurance costs. None of that comes in there. But now we got right here, homeowner's costs. So here at shelter, 21% of total housing. This is in 1982 now. Owner's equivalent rent is 14% of that. Hmm. That's weird. On top of re residential rent as well. Look, we had no renter's cost back then. We had residential rent, but now we got 6.3% going to residential rent and 13% going to OER. So that makes sense. The old way wasn't perfect, mind you. It overcalculated inflation for people who own their homes outright. Because why? If you owned your home outright, you don't have financing. You do have taxes and insurance, but you don't have financing and you don't have home purchase because you didn't buy your house. You already owned it. If you weren't buying a home, there'd be no purchase costs. If you weren't renting, you had no rental costs. Again, rental costs right here. <laughs> um, uh, even if you had a mortgage, did your interest rate actually change? Rocket Mortgage says only 9% of all new mortgages are adjustable. And most of those don't even adjust yearly. I have a adjustable, adjust every five years. So while the previous measure of household costs has some issues, it's much worse now because OER, which adds the cost to rent your own home to the cost of being a renter. 30% of the entirety of CPI is allocated this. And this has been happening since 1982. That's 40 years ago, amigos. Again, the BLS is saying that your house is a capital asset. It says, own housing units themselves are not priced in the CPI. Like most other nations, economic statistics, the CPI program views own housing units as a capital, a capital or investment good distinct from the shelter that provides and not as consumption goods. You hear that? It's a capital good, not as a it's consumption good. If they're going to do that, then your house should be treated as an item on the balance sheet and not as a consumption item on the cash flow statement. It's basic accounting 101. Housing has no place in CPI for who, those who own their own homes. 
even with a mortgage, because housing, the way it's currently calculated, is not a consumption good. <laughs> Remember, the objective of the CPI is to measure the change in expenditures required to maintain a given standard of living. How does OER or even rent measure a change in a homeowner's standard of living? You're not doing any of those things. They're measuring phantom housing costs as part of the inflation index. The BLS even goes on to say, quote, spending to purchase and improve houses and other housing units is treated as an investment, not as a consumption. So to actually per to maintain your home, to improve it, is treated as an investment and not as a consumption. Interest costs, such as mortgage interest, property taxes, real estate fees, maintenance, are all part of the capital goods and are also not treated as consumption costs. These non-consumption costs of own housing are out of scope of CPI. Dude, I just got my property tax bill. It's it's eight thousand bucks a year in property tax. That's not a consumption good, and it went up from seventy seven hundred dollars a year. So you know three hundred bucks more a year, and I did get a homestead exemption, so it's knocking off about thousand bucks. But still, that is not a consumption good. How could property taxes, insurance, real estate fees not be considered consumption goods? Well, the BLS says, and this is what makes this crazy. For an example, an increase in five percent of housing costs, according to BLS is more important than the same increase for telephone charges because most consumers spend more for housing than for telephone services. Yeah, but the problem is, of course, you aren't measuring housing costs properly, which leads to real-world distortions in the CPI. For percent, an example, a 10% increase in housing costs is a 3.7% increase in CPI, whereas a 20% increase in medical costs only accounts for a 1.69% CPI increase. Do you hear that? 10% equals 3.7 increase in CPI for housing. 20% of medical only equals 1.7% in, in, in CPI. Why? Because medical cost is weighted so much less than housing costs. But in the real world, what does a retired homeowner actually spend money on? Housing or healthcare, especially one who owns their house outright. Housing is the only part of CPI that puts a B in my bonnet. The next section will talk about transportation. Uh, 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 how Right here. Ah, it's crazy. Transportation is another one as well. But next session, we're going to talk about balance sheet versus cash flow statements. I'm not sure I'll do a video on this, actually, because um, I, I explained it well in my book. I don't know that will get very, very many views. If you're not getting many views, it's almost not worth doing the video, frankly. And you can always kind of, this video right here probably won't get a lot of views. But anyway, I, I, I talk about the difference between balance sheet and cash flow statements in my book. And uh, I, I, the average household spent 17.5% of their budget on private transportation which included 9.218% for the purchase of a new or used vehicle. So here, 17.4. A purchase of a new or used vehicle is 9.2. Of total CPI. Total CPI, 10% of CPI was for new, the purchase of a new or used vehicle. Did nearly 10% of your actual budget go to the purchase of a new or used vehicle last year? No. Then why would you use the purchase of a vehicle as part of your annual inflation numbers? Yet this is what the CPI does. They calculate inflation based on the assumption that nearly 10% of your annual spending will go to the purchase of a new or used vehicle. Again, what is CPI supposed to measure? The change in expenditures required to maintain a st given standard of living. Buying a vehicle doesn't do anything to maintain my standard of living. My current cars work just fine and they're all paid for. Interesting, the BLS even states, Transportation spending is the second largest component of overall expenditures, and it decreased substantially for both homeowners and renters from 1986 to 2010. It decreased by 22% respectively. The drop in transportation spending is likely because households purchased fewer vehicles in 2010 than they did 25 years ago because they're lasting longer, they're more efficient, and they're expensive. So it appears we're spending less in transportation than we did a generation ago, Will that ultimately be reflected in the CPI weightings? No, no, one would hope so, and one would be wrong. CPI has transportation 18% of total expenditures, which is almost 50% higher than it was in 1976. I guess I will go. So look at this. Here's CPI, right, hold on a sec, right there. Transportation, uh, hold on, right here. Transportation, this is from what, 1976. 13.54% is of C, of CPI in 1976 was for transportation. If we go to today, look at this right here. Today transportation 18%. So we take that's a 6% divided by 13. That's a 46% increase in transportation costs in CPI. Why? When they even admit that we're spending 22% less on our new vehicle on new and used vehicles than we did and of course, you're not even buying a new and used vehicle every year. That doesn't make sense.
Oh, by the way, this decrease in transportation costs isn't just for the purchase of a new used vehicle either. Gas, maintenance, whole thing. We're spending less on transportation than we did in 1986, and yet CPI has us spending 50% more of our total expenditures on transportation than we did in 1977. Uh, secondly, though, buying a car or a house, for that matter, is an asset purchase similar to the purchase of any durable good. You buy these goods infrequently. For instance, my refrigerator is over 10 years old. It works fine. I've had a tinker with it on occasion, but still does what it's supposed to do. I maintain my standard of living with my old refrigerator. So why should the monthly price of charge changes in fridges be included in my overall inflation rate? It shouldn't. It's a durable good. And even CPI said when it came to durable goods, essential when it comes to housing, they're not looking as a consumption item. They're looking as a capital item, i.e. a durable good. I can already hear the nattering nabobs and negativity, but Josh, you'll need to buy a new fridge at some point. This is true. It'll be the address in the way the purchase of any asset is. An accounting matter. As a capital good, not a consumption good. Capital goods go, uh, consumption goods go on the cash flow statement. Capital goods go on the balance sheet. I will either pay cash, thus reducing the cash assets on the balance sheet. So I have $100,000 of cash. I buy a $50,000 car. I spend cash on that. My balance sheet on my cash is reduced to 50,000 bucks. I had 100, 50,000 went to buy a new car. I now have 50. That's a balance sheet item. While at the same time increasing the value of per personal property assets. So I had no uh, cars worth 5,000 bucks. I buy new cars worth 50,000 bucks. I get it depreciated. So we'll say a $40,000 increase in, in uh, personal property and a $50,000 decrease in cash. That's how a balance sheet works. Or I'll take a loan that increases the liability side of the balance sheet, but still as the fridge or the car as an asset. And here we see right here, you got the liabilities right here. So if I borrow, this is your balance sheet. Your balance sheet is your assets minus your liabilities. That's your net worth. So if I borrow, I increase my automobile or personal property, however you want to look at a fridge or a car, doesn't matter. I increase my auto, my my assets, personal property assets, by the amount of the car's value, and I increase also my liabilities as well, right? So that's a net wash on the balance sheet. If, if you know, in terms of, if we're saying the fridge is worth 3,000 bucks, I'm not dep depreciating it or anything like that. Durable goods or any good you buy infrequently should be allocated to the balance sheet, as the example shows above. Durable goods, balance sheet, right here. Automobiles, personal property, that's a balance sheet item, not a cash flow item. There's no place in durable goods on the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement is for regular and consistent purchases, which is what inflation should be measuring, as they say. Because they say, well, how do we measure inflation? The objective of the CPI is to measure the change in expenditures required to maintain a given standard of living. That is a, a, a cash flow item on the cash flow statement, not a balance sheet. Ah. Is the change in the cost of items you purchase regularly where inflation really matters? Below is a simple cash flow statement that measures how much money came in and how much money went out. This cash flow. Well, the purchase of an asset was with either cash or debt has no net impact on your balance sheet. Financing item does change your cash flow statement. Why? Uh, because now we have uh, right here, we got a vehicle expense. We have to borrow money to pay the, the, the mortgage, not the mortgage, but the, uh, the car loan or the fridge loan, the credit card, the mortgage. That is a cash flow item. All right. So again, the purchase of an asset with either cash or debt has no net impact on your balance sheet, right? Because we're increasing our liabilities as simultaneously we're increasing our assets if we borrow, all right? If we pay for cash, we're decreasing our assets, but we're increasing our, our, uh, increasing our property. If we're borrowing, on the other hand, on top of increasing our liabilities, we are increasing our cash outflows though, all right? Remember, if you borrow, your loan payment is most likely a fixed payment and would be exempt from inflation adjustments. The only time inflation would be impact your borrowing is if you borrowed using short-term loans where interest rates adjust regularly. Businesses may do that, but no household does that. No one does it. In the next chapter, we'll go over some more inflation components of CPI that you should not use, and we'll hit transportation again. Anyway, again, if you like my book, buy it. It's a good book, dude. It was a good book. It will, it will solve your world in terms of saying there's no inflation no but i'll tell you how to measure your own personal inflation i did that i've done a video on that a couple months ago but now i got the book i can do another video on it because it's important but whatever the historical inflation rates are silly man you shouldn't use them you just how are we going to measure bond rates to return net of inflation well what inflation are you using whatever the cpi is oh my goodness love your thoughts we'll see you